another day of life. We thank you for the ability to smile, to laugh, to enjoy the sunshine, and to enjoy each other's company. But Lord, most of all, we thank you for the freedom to come to this place, to worship you together as a church family, to be drawn closer together, and ultimately drawn closer to you. Lord, I pray that you would bless this message. I pray that you would bless everyone that hears it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Robert LaRoe shared this. There's a cartoon that puts persecution in perspective. In the four panels, we see people praying. First, we see a New Testament Christian. Lord, give me the courage to face this accusing mob. Then a Reformation Christian. Lord, help me declare your truth despite the cost. A 20th century believer from Soviet Russia, Lord, may we persevere faithfully under these burdens. And then finally, today's American Christian. Lord, the Audi's been running rough lately. Guys, when we look at our situation, American Christians have often lived a charmed existence in comparison to the rest of history when it comes to persecution and difficulties because of our faith. But the Bible is honest about what to expect when you become a believer. <coughs> and a great example can be seen in the life of Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. Go and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to continue looking at this chapter that we began looking at last week. Now, last week we got to see that even the most fierce enemy of Jesus can become his most faithful servant. Even the most fierce enemy of Jesus can become his most faithful servant. This week, we'll see that the path of the believer in Jesus is not always an easy one, but it is the one worth taking. The path of the believer in Jesus is not always an easy one, but it is the one worth taking. We're going to start looking at Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 19. We're going to start looking at the second half of verse 19. This is what it says. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus, the son of, Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name. And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Guys, Jesus brings about an astonishing change in the lives of his followers. Jesus brings about an astonishing change in the lives of his followers. At some point, Saul had made his way to Arabia for a few years, but he comes back to Damascus, the place he had originally been coming to round up Christians and throw them in prison. Can you imagine the surprise from the people in Damascus about the change in Saul? The man who had once dedicated his life to capturing the followers of Christ had himself been captured by Christ. When you see that kind of change in someone, it can be nothing short of astonishing. Chuck Colson tells a story uh, and many stories of men in prison who had committed crimes but who came to Christ and who were thoroughly converted. No one would have guessed that some of these men would be devout followers of Christ one day. One such story was an account of a man named Danny. Danny had been a fighter, and he was in prison for murdering a man named John Gilbert. But someone gave him a Bible, and as he read it, he found himself being drawn to the Jesus that he was reading about. Colson tells the story, the more Danny felt drawn to Jesus, the more he himself saw himself in a new life. 
He was used to comparing himself to the guy at the next bar stool. And that was uh, something that helped him not feel so bad. He didn't look so bad in comparison to the next guy. But when he compared himself to Jesus, he started to feel afraid. The man who never raised his fists scared him as nobody else ever had. He also read the passages about people being cast into utter darkness, where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then he knew something about darkness. Lying on his bunk at night, Danny began to review his whole life. Horrified by the person he had become, he saw himself living for his next drink, his next drug party. He saw himself using women. His last girlfriend had been good to him, but he would have thrown her away for the next quarter ounce of drugs. In fact, he probably had. The next Sunday, when the guard called out for people who wanted to be let out of their cells to attend chapel, Danny shouted, Cell 16! But he sat like a stone through the service, hearing little. He was there to ask a question. Afterward, he approached Chaplain Bob Hansen and asked him if the passages he had read about outer darkness were really about hell. Yes, said the chaplain. Then I'm in big trouble, Danny said. When you get back to your cell, get on your knees by your bunk, said the chaplain. Confess your sins to God and pray for Jesus Christ to come into your heart. <clears throat> Danny did just that. In his cell, he knelt, confessed that he was a sinner, and asked Christ to be his Lord. As he did, he kept remembering horrible things he had done. And the memories brought both pain and an eagerness to be forgiven. Talking to God seemed like carrying on a conversation with someone he had missed all along without knowing it. He could almost hear God replying through a silence that echoed his sorrow and embraced it. Danny not only felt heard, he also felt understood, received. He slept that night and every night afterward. Eventually, Danny was released from prison got married and had five children. He then graduated from Wheaton College and was ordained. He went on to work with troubled kids in Boston and then was offered a job as a prison chaplain. He had been very far from the father, but turned around and began to work in the father's vineyard. What an astonishing change in the life of that man. Jesus brings about an astonishing change in the lives of his followers. That's what we see in the life of Saul. To go from a person who was set on destroying the church to being a person that was spreading the good news about Jesus. Jesus brings about an astonishing change in the lives of his followers. Look again in the text, starting at verse 23, Acts chapter 9, verse 23. This is what it says, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. If you are privileged to have a picture with you that you are coloring on, that is the image that you are coloring. Paul or excuse me, back then he was known as Saul, was being lowered through a, a window in a basket uh, out to save his life. Now, after several days of Saul sharing his faith, explaining that Jesus is the promised Messiah, there are people who have a serious problem with the message just as he used to have. You see, converting to Christ is often followed by rejection by the world. Converting to Christ is often followed by rejection by the world. There is a conspiracy to kill him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he shared about this experience. He said, In Damascus, 
The governor under King Eratos had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. I'm sure in between doing awful things, that governor wrote a scroll on leadership, too. It's so bad that the believers in Damascus had to get creative in getting Saul safely out of the city. There were homes built into the wall of the city, and they went to one and lowered him in a basket out the window. That is not the way I typically expect to spend my average night out on the town. But there was Saul being lowered in a basket out the window to save his life. It can be challenging to overcome persecution. Many of our sisters and brothers are persecuted even in our own time. I heard this story, uh, Voice of the Martyrs reported, for example, the experience of a young man named Philip who lived in Laos. Philip walked two hours to another village to hear the gospel, and just three weeks, weeks after he returned home as a new believer, the police paid him a visit. They told him that any religion other than Buddhism was strictly forbidden in that region, and they accused him of embracing the faith of foreigners and warned him that things were sure to go badly for him. Sometime later, the authorities pressed him to sign a document renouncing his newfound faith. He refused, and before long, his neighbors, incited by the local government, killed his livestock and harassed his children. Philip and his family had to move to another village, asked why he remained a Christian when it caused him so much difficulty. He said, My people are in darkness, worshiping they know not what and they are enslaved in their sin. I must tell them about Jesus. The only one who can save them from the destruction that awaits them. Others, like Philip, have suffered the loss of their jobs and their property. Some have been rejected by their family and friends. And many have been murdered for their faith in Christ. Converting to Christ is often followed by rejection by the world. But you see, Saul didn't have any hesitation about spreading the good news. He walked into a place where the people there would have been his former allies. They would have been the very people that, that would have joined in with him in persecuting the church. And it was to those people that he was willing to go and say, guys, I was wrong. Jesus really is who they say he is. <clears throat> As we look further in the text, starting at verse 26, it says this. When he came to Jerusalem, remember, he's escaped now. He goes to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. Sometimes it takes an encouraging believer to welcome a new believer into the community of faith. Sometimes it takes an encouraging believer to welcome a new believer into the community of faith. Saul was in a unique position that most Christians are not. He has actively campaigned against the church. He threw believers in prison. He approved of their deaths. We are told he tried to destroy the church. 
Can you imagine how awkward it must have been for him to walk into a meeting with the disciples? The hesitancy of the disciples showed uh, uh, the hesitancy that the disciples showed in the authenticity of Saul's conversion is very human and very understandable. And while most people are not in Saul's specific <coughs> situation, there are so many new Christians who can relate to the feelings that Saul no doubt had. Those feelings of walking into church and thinking to yourself, I've done bad things. I know God has forgiven me, but can other people forgive me for the things that I've done? Saul had been rejected by his former allies because he was now a Christian. He wasn't being accepted by Christians because of the things he had done in the past. And what had to be a very difficult time for him, a time where it would have been understandable if Saul was drowning in despair, just having to flee for his life, being let down in a basket. At a time when Saul could have been drowning in despair, a man named Barnabas came alongside of him like a spiritual life preserver. Barnabas is a recurring character in the New Testament, a wonderful believer, famous for his Encouragement. Have you ever met somebody like Barnabas? Have you ever known somebody like Barnabas in your life? It just seems like when they walk in the room, they just kind of brighten it up a little bit. It just seems like they've always got something good to say to you. They've always got a smile for you. They've always got a word of encouragement for you. Barnabas was like that. It would have been easy for Barnabas to just keep his mouth <laughs> shut, but instead he went the extra mile and he spoke up for Saul. He told the others about what had happened to Saul and what Saul had been doing since, and it made a huge difference. A preacher named Joe Hayes shared this story. The simple point to what God is reminding us of is the extra mile can change a life and win a soul to Jesus. To me, that makes the pain of going the extra mile a pleasure. I listened to an interview on Jer the Jeremy Vine show this week on Radio 2. At 10 years old, Martin Pistorius was taken ill with a sore throat and flu, and within a year was in what they call a vegetative state. Doctors said there was no hope, and they sent him home to die. For 14 years, Martin existed in a home for the profoundly disabled, living in his own world, but fully aware of the world around him, hearing every conversation and comment about him, but unable to respond. Martin lived a lonely, bored, and frustrated life, desperately wanting to communicate all that he was thinking and feeling, and on many occasions wishing he would just die. Nurses and doctors did all that was required to keep Martin alive, believing there was nothing more they could do, and more likely thought he would be better off dead. A turning point came in Martin's life at 24 years old when a volunteer came into his care home and took the time to talk with Martin. For two years, she spoke to him like he was there and he understood the volunteer watched a TV program about augmentative and alternative communication. She got excited and believed that this could help Martin. She spoke to doctors and nurses, but they were not <coughs> interested. She spoke to Martin's parents, who for a year worked at helping Martin with augmentative and alternative communication. Martin today is still paralyzed, but... With the use of an inferred device attached to his head, a computer communicates what he feels and thinks, and what's more, Martin now works as a web designer and tells the amazing story of falling in love over the internet and getting married, yes, getting married, um, this past year. Martin's life and future 
was transformed because one volunteer went the extra mile. She did more than what was required. Doing just enough for Martin would have meant he would still be living his lonely, bored, frustrated life, wishing he was dead. This volunteer went the extra mile to make sure Martin was included in life. No one should ever feel lonely or unwelcome at church. Maybe you can be like Barnabas was for Saul and go the extra mile to make sure that new believers are welcome and connected. Sometimes it takes an encouraging believer to welcome a new believer into the community of faith. There's a preacher named David Dykes that shared a story. He said, back when the Old West was being settled, <coughs> pioneers flocked across the country to California and Oregon. In one particular spot on the eastern slopes of the Rockies, there was a large dirt-covered rock protruding in the middle of the trail. Wagon wheels were broken on it and men tripped over it. Finally, someone dug up the odd stone and rolled it off trail into a nearby stream. The stream was too wide to jump over, but people used the stone as a step to cross the cold creek. It was used for years until finally one settler built his cabin near the stream. He moved the odd stone out of the stream and placed it in his cabin to serve as a doorstop. As years passed, Railroads were built and towns sprang up. The old settler's grandson went east to study geology. On a visit to his grandfather's cabin, the grandson happened to examine the old lump of stone and discovered within that lump of dirt and rock was the largest pure gold nugget ever discovered on the eastern slope of the Rockies. It had been there for three generations and people never recognized its value. To some, it was a stumbling stone to be removed. To others, it was a stepping stone. And to others, it was just a heavy rock. But only the grandson saw it for what it really was, a lump of pure gold. Jesus is the precious rock God has given us to be both the cornerstone and the capstone of our lives. Will you come to the rock today? Will you build your life upon him? One day you will discover Jesus will either be a stepping stone that gives you access to God, or he will be a rock over which you stumble, so close and yet so far. The choice is yours. Saul started out going one direction in his life. He was zealous for God. He thought he was doing the right thing by persecuting the church, but in time, he came to realize the error that he had made, the massive, monumental error, when he encountered Jesus for himself. And from then on, his life was changed forever. He started going in the complete opposite direction. He repented of what he had done wrong, and he turned to go in the direction of Jesus. I want to invite you guys to make that same decision. <coughs> The path of the believer in Jesus is not always an easy one, but it is the one worth walking because this is the path that leads to eternal life. Let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the stories that we read in the Bible, the stories just like Saul or Tarsus, because it is in his story we see the scale of redemption played out in the life of one man, a man who was doing horrible things and making horrible mistakes and yet <coughs> had not moved so far beyond your grace that you could not reach him. Lord, we see in the forgiveness that you offer to him, the forgiveness that you offer to us as well. Lord, I pray that you would touch the hearts of every person that hears this message. Would you remind us again of the forgiveness and love and grace and mercy that you extend to each one of us. All we need to do is to come to you. And so Lord, I pray if there is anyone here today who is in need of your help, I 
pray that they would come to you and receive that help that only you can provide. Lord, we thank you for loving us so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen.